Hello, 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 and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and super lucky this week to bring to you Chris Dufay. This guy is just a bundle of enthusiasm. He has an incredible story. We talk a lot about his before and after photos and how he's radically changed his body composition. But not only that, his story about how nutrition was for him so much more than that. He has changed his entire mindset and his entire life and is so grateful for life now because of his journey with nutrition. And we dig into that and tons of other actionable tips. This guy's incredible. You're going to love it. So tune in and I hope you enjoy. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. All right, Chris, thanks for being on the show, my man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be sitting down here with you. Here in beautiful Santa Monica on the little boardwalk. I, I'm, I feel for all you listeners right now because we are looking at a fantastic view. So hopefully we deliver as well. It's beautiful. Um, so I wanted to start. You, you are a very impressive physical specimen. Yeah. <laughs> and a very fit guy. And I thought you'd always been that way. Uh, not until recently I saw one of your Instagram posts where it was kind of like a before and after photo. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, this guy's been through some stuff. Mm. And so I just wanted to chat and get your story firsthand from that before photo to the after photo. Okay. So I was a very overweight um, child, teenager especially. It really affected my self-esteem, how I thought of myself, looked at myself, how I felt in the world, where my place was. Um, it really sucked. Like really looking back at my childhood, it was one thing that was really bad. I was always athletic. I always played sports, but again, looking back, I was held back with how good I could have been as an athlete because of my weight. Um, and it simply just stemmed back to bad eating. It was just really poor eating habits, overeating, binge eating, um, and a bad relationship with food. So that stemmed, uh, throughout the end of school. Then I finished school. Um, I got a nine to five job, like managing stuff. I hated the nine to five world is not for me. <laughs> Quickly found that out. And then I started to train. I got back into the gym. I joined a gym with a mate. Then I tried to figure out how to lose weight. And I'm sure as so many listeners could vibe with me right now. You can try all the different diets. You can try so hard. You can do I mean count the calories cut the carbs, do the workouts, pound it away, not see the results that you want. And it was very frustrating for me. Finally, I started to figure out what happened. That photo you saw was actually interesting because that is very deep into me. I was a personal trainer there for still three to four years, I would say at that point. Um, And it was me trying everything. So that photo actually, it, it, cuts a deep wound with me in a good way because that photo is me at a course learning to get people and myself in better shape but I know at that point in time I was doing everything I possibly could like I was really in a bad state mentally as well trying to get there and it's hilarious because that photo the after photo do you know I mean like where I'm at now I don't worry about food. I have a gr- much better relationship. It's not perfect, um, but I have a much better relationship with food. I have a much better relationship with myself as well, which I think is something I've really had to work on. So um, it's been a journey and it's something I'm really passionate about helping others go through right now because I don't want them to have to go through what I g- went through. Right. So I don't think a lot of people know this, but that's a similar story that I went through as well. Mm. So I, I was in the same exact boat. I had the same issues as overweight pretty much my entire youth. Um, used to struggle with self-esteem issues, poor relationship with food, all that stuff. So I can I feel you there. But And that's also the, one of the main drivers that pushes me forward wow. and, and, and helps me just wake up every day and be like, okay, there's like, we're going to reduce suffering in this way yes. and use food as a tool and something that's positive instead of something that's negative. Dude, I'm so with you. What, are, what were the biggest things that you saw were holding you back from that before photo to the after photo? 
knowledge is the first thing that comes to my mind. But honestly, secondly, I think it's probably like a look of self-love. Like, did I actually love myself? Did Was I in the actual right mindset with what was going on? Um, because like it's, I really look back and go, I was doing everything right. Do you know what I mean? Like right. I was training my ass off and it really came to a point I remember because at one stage I was a personal trainer. I was booked up, personal trainer, fantastic, um, fully booked. I was training, do you mean, one to two times every single day. I was hard on my diet and I remember at one point I, I just felt really bad, like as in like sluggish, tired, low sex drive and I'm like, I'm in my early 20s at this point. And I went to see a functional med doctor, got some testing done. And I remember because he sat there when I got my um, labs back and he was like, <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he goes, he goes, Chris, you've got the testosterone of a 70 year old. And he goes, look, you've got some muscle on you, but like your lifestyle and everything is just not right. And I was like, oh my God, like, do you know what I mean? Like I'm pounding myself. I'm pounding myself every single day trying to improve how I look and how I feel and it was not working and it was finally figuring out what does work and it literally took me going to see experts all around the world um, and being able to sit down with them like I did multiple internships with some of the best coaches around the world I went and did every certification that I could possibly actually walk into the room I read all the different books I listened to all the different audios and it was from then piecing that together as well and that's why like with this book it's that's not me like the acknowledgements is where the secret source is at wherever the page is it's because there's so many people that I've been able to learn from. It's just I wanted to put the experts' secrets into a guide for people to be able to follow because that's what I've been able to use. Right. And so the book you're ch- chatting about is Craving the Truth, which you just launched. Yeah. Right. So this is just your journey essentially and everything that you learned to get from that before photo to the after photo? Totally. Okay. So what are some of the highlights that you think – so obviously mindset was one thing that you had to change drastically. But what about like the actual – things where it came to nutrition, where it came to movement, maybe stress management, sleep, things like that. Totally. Okay. So nutrition was mm, biggest part, stop restricting myself. Stop trying to be so hard on myself. Stop trying to do things that are so radical. It was like one radical approach to the next um, because that stuff doesn't work. And especially in a state of mind where you start to deprive yourself, what do you want? You want what you don't, what you can't give yourself. And that's not a that's not a healthy way to look at it because if you're saying I can't have that not I don't want that it's a very different mindset in the way that you actually look upon what's going on so firstly I've been able to find a way where I really enjoy food I really enjoy the way that I train now and like even still like say going through that journey even competing as a fitness model my last competition like I wouldn't call myself bulimic, but there was periods where, you know what, I ate so much food and then I threw up after and it switched in my head. I went, oh, hang on. I was able to enjoy that food, but I'm not going to suffer the consequences of everything that I just piled down. That was a sickening thought. That was really bad of me. So it was being able to learn, okay, how do I actually treat food and how do I look upon it first? What is it that I need to be eating that makes me feel good? How do I actually... Um, thrive on a day-to-day basis and what's going to change my physique at the same time because there are two different things there is how do I eat to feel good how do I eat to actually change my physique especially when wanting to go to that nth level wanting to compete as a fitness model or do you mean get to really low levels of body fat which to tell you the truth is most likely not going to be a lot of the listeners right now so therefore we don't need to talk about that we can talk about Focus on your quality of food. Focus on your health and the side effect is going to be you looking better. Like that's why I say this book, it's a Trojan horse. It's wrapped with a weight loss book. It's wrapped up in this is what's going to make you look better. But what I know in the way that I actually um, put this and designed it was it's going to make you a better person. Therefore, you're going to be able to get in shape as well. Right. I think this is a good point that when you focus on health, a lot of the physique stuff kind of came. Obviously, there was some fine tuning at the end when you were competing yes. and everything. But the same type of thing goes with, let's say, a job or a business where if your goal is money, you're, you're going to have a lot of missteps and, and you're going to mess up a lot. But if your goal is to just provide value and help people, yeah. that will come as a side effect. And I think if you think about it the same way, we are trying to help yourself and get healthy, then a lot of the things that you 
kind of want as a side effect will come effortlessly. Totally. So what are some of the things you said, like food quality, for instance, what were you doing before that you had to change to get to that, that kind of that after health perspective? I think looking at foods just to say like a calories perspective, definitely top line. And then like you can go one level deeper and say just looking at things that say like macronutrients. I'm a very big believer of the quality of foods that you need to be looking at. This whole book is focused about quality over quantity. Because everybody's looking at quantity right now. Everybody's looking at how much protein do I need to be eating or how much fats do I need to be eating? How many calories do I need to be eating? How many hours of cardio do I need to be doing? It's all quantity based. Right. Let's look at the quality of things first because as well, you can function much better day to day when you start actually feeding yourself and thriving off what you're actually looking at. So the quality of foods is something like, I just don't eat, okay, I won't say that, very vast majority of the time, I will not eat shitty foods. So yesterday, coming back from San Jose, I had like a protein cookie. I stopped off at Whole Foods, got some great food, but then I had this protein cookie. As soon as I ate it, I was like, oh, what did I do that for? I feel really crappy. I thought my brain, like I was trying to read this book. I was reading The, the 12 Rules of Life by Jordan amazing, Peterson. Amazing. Oh yeah, I was like, tough I'm not process, in the right tough, state yeah, of mind. Tough to, to process after <laughs> eating a cookie, huh? Yes, exactly. Looks intense. So it, it's just looking at the qualities first. So looking at, look, Number one, the top of the totem pole is eat nutrient-dense whole foods. Do that. The second um, quality that we want to be able to look at is move every day. If that's weight training, if that's Zumba, if that's going for a walk, if that's gymnastics training, if that's CrossFit, doesn't matter. We need to be moving every single day. The next level under that is actually bridge the nutrition gap. And that's where we do need to use supplements, but they are a supplement as well. Do you know what I mean? So it's not the main focus, but we like it's shown we can't get the actual quality of our nutrition from our foods simply from farming practices at the end of the day it's a lot lower quality and then fourth level upgrade your lifestyle and that's where we really look at sleep and stress right so looking at food quality like you said i think that people miss this and try to go with it if it fits your macros approach yeah and then fill in the gaps there but if you always this is another thing where if you aim for quality mm you're not going to have to worry about the exact macronutrients. You, you simply like really cannot eat, overeat a quality rich diet in my opinion. Totally. It's, it's very, very difficult. Totally. And so you're traveling around a lot. So you, mm. you're kind of like in a little bit of a nomad state currently. Mm, yeah. How do you adapt your quality standards to that? Um, it's something that I had a, like I've been traveling a lot the last two, three years myself and really had to get in kind of like a home and away routine. How do you cope with traveling and being on the road and making those kind of convenient but healthy decisions? Really good question. And that is where number one, fasting comes in. Right. But it's so brilliant. It is. It makes life so much easier because when you can go, you know what, I've got, I've got some flights coming up tomorrow. Rather than figuring out, okay, I'm going to have to go and cook, get some Tupperware, try and fit it all in my bag, carry it around. What if it spills in my bag? Like all that kind of stuff. I'm just not going to wait. I'll sort it when I get to the other side. And actually you, the use of fasting, especially when traveling long distances and time zones really helps as well. Um, but when it comes to the quality of food, I will just... I won't go and eat at a crappy place, especially the use of like bad oils in foods. Right. Th that does me over. Like I will notice straight away if a restaurant's been using bad oils because I'll just feel really crappy straight away. So it's always um, do the research ahead of time. So let's just say like, look, it's so easy. Like let's say Whole Foods is everywhere and anywhere around here. So I will literally land, I'll Google where's the Whole Foods and I'll be able to go get some food. So I mean, I'll be like, what type of meat do I want to eat? Do I want something that might be like turkey or chicken, something that might be a little bit leaner because then I want to might add some like MCT or coconut oil. Then I just want to pile on heaps of veggies. I'm a very big believer of, especially for me, I just like eating a lot of vegetables as well. So I really cram them in and then I can move on for the rest of the day and get on with life. Right. I think you have a, a lot packed into that answer, which is amazing. I think one of the biggest ones that I want to hit on is when people, especially when they go to a higher fat diet and start removing some processed carbohydrates, they don't pay attention to the quality of the oils and the cooking oils mm. when eating out. And so they go, whatever, it doesn't have carbohydrates, should be good for me. No, not the case. And this is what, after processed carbs and sugars, after you cut those out of your diet, the next thing for me to tell people is vegetable oils. Oh my God. Like, I'm such a big oils. believer of this. Yeah. You must be aware of those and take them out. Like they are literal poison. Um, so what do you notice when you when you have these terrible oil, oils that 
brain first thing. Yep. I, I just like brain cognition. I just feel it drop a couple levels straight away. Um, after that, I just feel a bit crook in my guts. And I'm just like, I don't know. What, like, I think it's more of a like intuitive. My, my gut, my second brain right. is telling me, Chris, you did bad. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Choose better next time. But I noticed straight away with my brain, it's just like, it's just not there. And that pisses me off because I want to be on, on my game the entire time. Do you know what I mean? Like, even right. if I'm on a plane last night flying and I'm reading 12 Rules of Life, I want to soak in every single word that he's written. And that's where, like, it's funny. I'm so anal now at the moment of where we choose where to eat out as well because especially in Bali, there's a lot of, like, healthy places, but we know they use bad oils. Right. And there's been a lot of times where we've might have eaten out at a restaurant and my wife Lauren and I were like heading home after it. And I'm like, we kind of like look at each other and I'm like, Ugh, I don't feel great after that. And we know that's the problem. But it's supposed to be healthy. I mean, one of the things you can do to get around that's that I've started to be the annoying guy at a restaurant, but just asking, what are you cooking this with? Yes. Or going back to another point of yours, choosing things that just don't aren't going to have that. It's like yep. I said, if you get lean meats, yep. you don't have to really worry as much about the quality of the meat because most of the good in the meat and most of the bad in the meat is in the fat. Right. And so then if you, if you're choosing leaner meats that are say grilled instead of not fried or like in a sauce, something like that, yep. then you're just removing that as well. And you don't even have to ask the question. So that's a great yeah. point for the people to take home with it because they might have heard me say, I, like, I choose the lean meats, but I choose the lean meats because I don't want to get the crappy fat from right. it because then I can have the good fats from somewhere else. You know what I mean, I can go get a nice jar of coconut butter for say, and I'll have something like that and really enjoy it. Right, and this is one of the things too that y your body, every cell is made up of fat. Like you have the phospholipid bilayer, like literally your cells made of fat. All your home is made of fat. Like the quality is paramount. Mm. And so if you're eating bad oils, people don't realize also that it takes about two years for that cellular layer to turn over. Really? Yeah. And so essentially every meal you've eaten the last two years, some of it is comprising your cells. It, like if that doesn't put a rocket up our backsides to make sure we do the right yeah. choices. Then and so it, it's not just a transient thing. And so people say like, oh, haha, cheat meal, or I'm just going to, I'm going to cheat once yes. a week. Yes. Well, once a week for two years, you're going to have some of that that you're going to incorporate into your body. Like your, your body uses the food you eat as building blocks. It's as simple as that. One of the chapters in the book is, I called it the death of cheat meals. And it's something I've liked to, I mean, a lot of people kind of want to kick back against, but there was two reasons why I just don't like cheat meals, especially for the general population, which is 99% of the people. One, the psychological aspect of it, the use of our words is so powerful. Right. And if we're saying I'm having a cheat meal, there's a lot of bad energy that can come behind that and therefore go into the choices of what you're going to have. But also, if you're choosing things that have just got really bad fats in it, which is a lot of the time what people are going to be choosing when they go through a cheat meal, you're just doing yourself over. And it's not about, oh, the, the carbohydrate or the fat composition of the food. It's the quality of the food again. Right. And so, th so that is another great point. It, as well, you said so you use fasting a lot, yep. which can be intimidating for some people who have never tried it before. And especially if you're coming from a higher carbohydrate place and have never done like a low carb a ketogenic diet, it can be very hard because your body just doesn't, does not have the machinery yep. to switch over to using fat for fuel. But that's something that I've used a lot in the past while traveling is, especially on longer flights, like you said, I've noticed that if I do exogenous ketones and fasting for a 16 hour flight, no jet lag. Yep. If, and then if I get up in the morning and just do a, a really intense workout, over in a day. Yep. No problems. Totally with you. And so there's actually a lot of research showing that your mitochondria ha handle that much, much better. Mm. And that's one of the things that, you know, there's, there's lower quality oxygen in the planes. I mean, you don't have quality water. You don't have quality food. And so it's just a big burden on your body. Mm. So it has to recover from that stress. And so taking that stressor away and letting your body just basically clean up itself is a good way to uh, mitigate a lot of that stuff while traveling. Um, when did you start using fasting as, as a tool? Like like this this morning, we, we met at a coffee shop before and... It, Ask me uh, one thing. Nope, fasting. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I'm good to go. Um, it's funny. So when the kind of the whole like intermittent fasting thing came out, like especially when I was a personal trainer, um, a couple of the people I was learning from. Anyway, I was totally against it. I was like, ah, fasting? Are you kidding me? I'm going to lose all my hours, muscle. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I'm going to stoke my metabolism. Anyway, that's a bunch of hogwash and complete lie. Um, I've been using fasting uh, very often three and a half years now 
Um, and I've probably been using a little bit longer form fasting. So like I uh, do like a 24 hour once a week now for about a year now as well. So intermittent fasting um, has been in there. But again, I call it like the anti-douche way to intermittent fasting. I don't say, okay, I'm going to do a 18 hour fast. It's an arbitrary number that I've just pulled out of thin air. Right. If my, let's say last night, um, I say my two daughters, maybe they had a really bad sleep. Maybe they kept us up. Okay. So therefore I've got a higher stress level going into the next day. So that means my body isn't going to be able to tolerate certain things in certain environments and certain stresses such as fasting that next day as well. So if I become um, really cranky, angry, um, hangry, some people call it as well. Like if I'm just not a great person, I feel myself drop down and, and I'm like, I need to eat. I'm just going to eat. I'm going to get on with my day. Again, other days I might just be like, you know what? I'm just, I'm not hungry. I'm just going to keep on going right now. And therefore I choose it. So there's not an exact hour that I kind of stick to. Again, when it comes to people getting into this, just like you said, some people might freak out when we say fasting. I like people starting off with a 10 hour fast. So I simply say, okay, let's say your last meal of the day is 8 p.m. Let's work backwards right now. We go 8 p.m. Your first meal is going to be at 10 a.m. right now. Let's just use that and eat as many meals as you want. I don't care if it's one or if it's six, you eat with your hunger especially if you're looking at the quality of the foods that you're eating as well. If you stick to, I'm eating nutrient whole dense foods and you're using the right portions between those meals, let your hunger tell you. At the start, it's not going to be 100% because people aren't going to be in tune with them and that's perfectly fine because this isn't about giving you a diet that's like, here you go, follow this for the rest of your life. I want to teach you how to fish. I want you to figure out what's best going to work for your body because it's always going to change. Yeah. And I think you make a good point too about being in tune with your body and having that intuition of, oh, I actually am hungry yeah. or I'm not hungry. And just listening to that and not letting societal expectations of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks yes. fill your life. And so in my opinion too, I've seen this with, with, with my patients and just with tons of people is that when you don't eat real food, your body cannot tell if you're hungry. Like it does not know what it has or what it needs. And it's, it's pretty magical system when you switch over to eating real food. You're like, oh, I'm, just, I'm not hungry, especially when you go to the higher fat spectrum of things. Yeah. And, and that's the same way I approach it too. Everyone wants to answer like, well, should I do 18 hours? Should I do 16 hours? Should I do 20 hours a day? It's like uh, my approach day to day is kind of the same thing. I generally fast in the morning until whenever I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of times that looks... How freeing is that? Yeah. It's just like it's liberating at the end of the day. Yeah, it's great. And so a lot of times for me, that looks like so I work out maybe like one or 2 PM yeah. and it's after that, I have like a, a big salad or a big smoothie with, with tons of vegetables and tons of fat. And that's when I usually break my fast. Yep. If I'm hungry before that and I eat before that, but I'd say like maybe four to five days a week, it, it looks like that where I mean, I maybe I have some fat in the morning. Like I had a, a butter coffee with MCT oil and butter this morning yep. just to tie me through a bunch of interviews today. But other than that, I'm, I'm not hungry. I probably won't be for a, a good period of time. I'm totally with you. So, you're talking about moving every day. Uh, what What is your preferred way of like getting people on track with that and like getting that habit started in the beginning? So I break movement down into like two main forms. There's like what we call metabolic resistance training, which is simply like your weight training. And then there's also what I call like yin movement, which is like the yin to your yang. So whether it's I'm a huge fan of walking. So whether it's going out for a walk, whether it's taking your dog out, whether it's taking your kids out for a play, whether it's going for a surf, going for a hike, going for a bike ride, doing something that's actually enjoyable, but I'm not classifying that as cardio. I'm not classifying that as training. Right. Like when I go for my morning walks, I'm stumbling along listening to an audio book. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there's nothing strenuous going on right now. So there's a lot of great factors. Yes, you're going to be churning through some energy. You're going to be being able to balance out your blood sugars. You're going to be able to actually have better stress management as well. But then when it comes to training, I think your metabolic resistance training, your weight training is going to be your biggest bang for your buck. Start with three times a week half an hour, three times a week, and we can build upon of that. It's easy. It doesn't need to be complicated. You don't have to be going to the gym if you don't have to, like all those things. But again, you need to be doing some sort of resistance style training as well. Because I feel like if somebody's wanting to be able to improve their physique and improve their body and their health and their mind, then that's going to give you the best results. What type of movements do you like for resistance training? 
your big bang for your buck movements are going to be like your squats, your deadlifts, your chins, your pushes. So again, like a, a really simple workout that I love, like really when I'm stuck for time is I'll go from a squat to a chin up to a deadlift to a dip. And I just do that in a circuit and I'll just pump that out for 20 minutes. Like that's my go-to, okay, I've got no time. I need to absolutely get something in right now. And I always feel great. And again, it's like, it pushes the heart barrier, which is a great thing. It's a mental toughness thing as well because you've got to like get through that. Um, but it's also, you're going to actually see the results as you go throughout the day as well. Yeah, that's excellent. Sounds a lot like what I did a couple hours ago. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned before how, and we, we chatted before, it's saying how when you train, you eat carbohydrates differently on days that you don't train and you kind of cycle it in and out. What's your experience with kind of a, a low carb ketogenic diet and how do you recommend people use that? Totally. So from, this from is a really good question and something I'm, re I'm really playing, experimenting with as well, both with myself and with members. So I used to do like the whole low carb thing for a long time and it wasn't keto. It was just low carb. Right. <laughs> so I wasn't doing it right to be telling you the truth. Um, then I've been able to use carbohydrates and see that and what we we're talking about earlier, the importance of metabolic flexibility. And I've been really tinkering around with this. So for me, I enjoy eating carbohydrates at the end of the day, uh, which would usually be five to six days out of the week. Uh, I train later in the day. So I train usually about 2 or 3 p.m. Um, the morning is usually going to be a bit of a fast or then I'll just have like a salad with a bit of like chicken or some turkey or some bison or something like that um, and then I'll include some MCT oils in there just because I want something quick but again what I was saying before was during the day I eat for fuel and I eat because I just want to perform during the day I just want to be the best husband I want to be the best father I want to be the best entrepreneur I want to be the best friend I just want to be the best person that I can be going throughout the day for me dinner is when I like to sit down i enjoy my dinner with my family i want to do it that's my much larger meal of the day um and therefore i can actually enjoy food and i can have that release as well and i'm never feeling restricted i'm never feeling deprived out of it so for me i'll include the carbohydrate to the end of the day and this is where i've been tinkering and especially using um your perfect keto supplements this, in the this is not a no, 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 the chocolate ones I'm a massive fan of, but using that in the morning of the next day after a heavy carbohydrate rich dinner to then get myself back into that prime state to then move forward from there. So that's where I've been tinkering around with using, okay, where do we use a keto supplement if we do? How can we incorporate, say, a little bit of fasting to obviously get your blood sugars back down? Do we want to get um, our ketone levels back up? And being able to have a balance of metabolic flexibility of using both of those fuel sources. And also, I am at the stage of at my training, I am actually wanting to gain a little bit of muscle size at the yeah. moment as well. So that is putting that into context as well. Because to tell you the truth, life can be really easy when you just kind of cut the carbohydrates out. Like the conversation we were having before when I asked you, I was like, why would we ever want to come out of ketosis? Because it's a serious question. If you're feeling so good and if you're functioning well, then that's great. But for me, I'm actually wanting to improve my physique in certain ways. Right. And so how does your nutrition shift if you do want to do that as a goal? to build muscle, correct. I will include more carbohydrates um, and I will include more protein during the day as you well. you time those around a workout or, or what's your timing on those? Yeah, look, to be perfectly honest, I used to do like um, pre, intra and post carbohydrates. I'm not a massive fan of it. Okay. It just didn't really fit me. I'm not like, I used to compete as a fitness model. I don't anymore. So therefore I'm not going to go to those nth degrees. Um, I just much rather eat them at the end of the day for like the reasons that I said before. Um, I've never really felt the need. Like if, okay, sorry, I take that back. Um, if there's days where I've trained twice in a day, which has been a couple of times, but not very often, but if I'm like, okay, I'm up for it, I'm really going to push myself. Um, if I do do an AM weight training session, I will include some carbohydrate before my PM training session. Okay. And what are the carbohydrates, even now when you're, you know, let's say at a maintenance type of mode, what do those carbohydrates look like for you? Sweet potatoes, I love. Yeah. Um, sweet potatoes. I do include rice. So it's paleo-ish. So like I do include rice every now and then. Um, there's, there's been rice cakes that I've gotten as well and they've been delicious. I don't know why I've been eating rice cakes like a sumo wrestler. It's been hilarious. I don't know why. Like, again, but not the greatest food source. So like... Um, what else have I been really enjoying? 
mango sticky rice I'm a fiend for. I really enjoy that. Um, so usually it's like root vegetables. Okay. Um, quinoa, I'm not so for myself. I don't feel like I'd, I really vibe with it very much. Um, buckwheat, yeah, as I can kind of get into it. But I usually like keeping it pretty simple. Okay, perfect. And so what I usually like to ask most people is, and we've kind of covered this for yourself for um, nutrition now. So awesome. So it looks like kind of a paleoish type of diet, a lot of fasting, carbohydrates in the evening. Um, if you had one ask to give people for a change in nutrition, what would it be? Eat quality food. Look at your quality over your quantity. If you focus on quality, I have seen it time and time again, the quantity starts to take care of itself. So look at foods where you actually thrive off. Again, nutrient whole dense foods. Yes, that's a gray area and it's open for play. And that's where the responsibility lays on the listener right now. Like the responsibility lays with you to look for it. So eat quality foods and enjoy it. Perfect. And then for movement, it sounds like you're doing some intense weight training. And then you like your walks. Is there anything else that you kind of do on a day-to-day basis that you try to get in? Whatever um, the person enjoys, do. Like um, say when I'm back in Bali, I want to get I want to be surfing every now and then. I do uh, kickboxing once or twice a week as well. That's more of a yang style movement. So if, if I am including that, I will include a lot more walking, but walking, bike riding, um, and just moving, just generally moving. And it helps when I have a four and a two year old, like two daughters, because I get to run around and play with them. But that, I think that's actually very important as a part of the actual movement base, because I went from being, say, a personal trainer, uh, for 10 years in a gym, obviously it's very active. You're carrying weights the whole time, like you're moving the entire time to now running my online businesses where I'm sitting at a desk. And I really noticed, I was like, holy shit, I am doing exactly what my clients for the last 10 years yep. were complaining about. Now I'm in this position. So I'm constantly trying to get up and move. I walk every morning. Um, I usually try and get up and go for a walk in the middle of the day as well. And then I'll train later on in the evening. It's perfect. Yeah. I noticed that I also made that switch in the last couple of years ago. Oh, oh man. <laughs> This is what it feels like? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so what's one ask for movement that you would say? Just get out and move? Just get out and move. Whatever you enjoy in the style of movement, just do. Every single day, you've got to get out and move. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. So stress management. We haven't talked a lot about that. Mm. I think that you touched on it briefly before when you were saying that a lot of it was mindset for you. Can you just explain what the day-to-day maintenance of kind of stress management is like? Yeah. Numero uno for stress, sleep. I think sleep is vitally, vitally important. Um, To have a great day, finish the day before well. And so I'm a really big believer of having a wind down routine now going into sleep. So being able to, yes, your bedroom should be pitch black. It should be cool. There should be no noise. I think having like a bat cave for a bedroom, very important. Um, Quality of your bed sheets the Airbnb that we're at right now. So like I've been to sport, like I love linen bed sheets because they're just great. The quality of the bed sheets in this Airbnb at the moment aren't fantastic. And I noticed that therefore my temperature regulation throughout the night hasn't been great. So I'll be like really cold um, or I get really hot and have to kick off the sheets and everything like that. So I've noticed that difference and I've been using the aura ring to track my sleep as well. So I've been looking at the actual data coming back from that. Um, But an hour before going to bed, Ultimately, you want to really get rid of all technology. Take take the lights out. If you like, I know you can get special lights that obviously take out the blue light of it as well. But take away technology first, and either connect with yourself or your loved one. Like that's where my wife and I like. We'll sit down um, and we'll have like the that four sigmatic um, reishi. Right. We'll have one of those. Sit down and we just get to connect for the day as well. So it's that and being able to chill out before bed because then the quality of sleep is fantastic. Okay. So one, I was going to ask you about sleep, but boom, nailed it. <laughs> awesome. Any, anyone ask for stress or sleep? Um, I would say have at least 30 minutes going into sleep. No technology. Okay. No tech, no phone, no iPad, no TVs. Nothing. Yeah, it's a tough ask for people to do that a lot of times. And what I usually recommend is... It, you know, isn't that scary though? Yeah. That, we, that we're that connected to the technological Tethered. devices? Like, come on. Like... 30 minutes before bed, like chill out. Do you know what I mean? Like your notifications can wait for tomorrow. Yeah. So I usually plug my phone in to charge Mm -hmm. downstairs in my house and then go upstairs like an hour before I would want to be asleep. Yes. And then read. Yep. So I... I read on a device, but yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I don't, it's on airplane mode, yep. so I don't yep. mess with it. We actually, and that's the thing. It's not going to be 100% perfect. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
I'm, and that's the thing as well. I feel like a lot of people, if it's not perfect, they just don't do anything at all. And it's just like, let's just take small steps together. Do you know what I mean? If it's 30 minutes and you're just getting off your technological devices, cool, you're doing a fantastic thing. We can make progress later. One of the hot tips I'd like to throw out there about sleep that has changed dramatically for us. Like yeah. you said, lights getting, like I know people wear the glasses and all this type of stuff that block the blue light. Um, I just installed Philips Hue lights all around the house. Yeah, I have heard of those, yeah. yeah. And you can control like timing schedules. And so I set it at 8 p.m. So I usually try to go to bed before That's 10. Cool. Where it turns like completely orange and dims it down. I'm like, oh, it's the time to start winding down for the That's night. That's cool. So I really tea, like that. Like do, do some journaling, do some preparing for the next day and then plug the phone in, go upstairs. And it's just like this automatic thing that I don't have to worry about anymore. Yeah. And the lights are out at, I, think I set them for 9.30. Yeah. And then also... I have, uh, we have room darkening shades, Yes. which I don't like to wake up to actually, because then I feel like a zombie because I'm not getting natural light. Yes, yes. So I've set, you can set also in the application, this podcast, by the way, is sponsored by Philips here. Just <laughs> um, you, can, you can set in the application to have it rise whenever the sun is locally to you. That's and so, then, so then cool. Then when you do want the blue light and you do want more of like a sunlight environment, it will happen without having to open your shades. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, I it's like amazing. that yeah, a it's, lot. It's a huge, huge change. Can I, can I cheat? Can I take a second one for the stress side of things? Because yep. you snuck that in, cheeky bugger. Journaling. I found yeah. journaling to be a game changer for me. If there's any way where I can check myself before I wreck myself, it's journaling. Like It's amazing how just sitting down with yourself with pen and paper, before I can even get the words out written down, I know if I'm talking shit to myself. Right. And it's brilliant because I can just be completely honest. It's just like a bit of a cleanse to the soul. And it's something I've been doing every day now. And I'm a huge believer of it. Not for everybody, but try it and see how it goes. Yeah, I do. I do morning and evening. Yeah. yeah. So it's just for me too, it's been a game changer. And I noticed that if I don't do it, similar to meditation, like if I don't meditate on a regular basis and I don't do these journaling practices, yeah, I, I, it's just so much stuff going on in life right now that it's it's easy to get agitated or frustrated like if you lock that stuff on a paper yeah it's gone you don't have to worry about it anymore yes it's magical totally um so you said the book is all about like you said this trojan horse of weight loss and yeah and really the the big message behind it if someone were to pick this up like what are some key highlights that they would learn say from it they would learn of the mystery so they don't need to get caught up with like do you know what I mean you don't have to count calories or you don't have to get all intertwined with macronutrients you don't have to be pounding away running the whole time so i really debunk a lot of the myths at the start just to take the pressure off your shoulders and just say you know what the stuff that you've been doing so far it hasn't worked but it's not your fault it's okay right now and let's go through a really easy process to what is going to work and that's where we just break it on down and we go you know what let's just focus on your quality of food first let's get you moving a little bit let's take some stress um, out of your life and let's obviously bridge your nutrition gap and life can be so much better because you're actually taking care of your health and crazy when I first thought I was going to like start to write this I thought it was going to be very training nutrition orientated it really went to the psychological side of what's going on yep. it's so important and if you don't actually have that that's where I feel like so, like the very very that's why I wrote it is because I, I was like I really need to get this out people aren't talking about what's inside of this when it comes to your relationship with food your relationship with yourself when it comes to the placebo effect a lot of people haven't asked, like the placebo effect is obviously so clear in say drugs, for instance, but if you're eating food and you don't think it's going to be serving you, if you feel guilt behind that food, do you think that's going to be nourishing you the best way it can be? Do you think it could possibly have a different um, mechanistic um, uh, change in your body compared to what it could be? I, I believe it is, especially after going through the science of it. Yeah, interesting. It's a good point that I don't think a lot of people bring up. Um, and you're doing a really cool thing in the back end of this book with the profits too. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I really enjoyed writing the book. I really enjoyed putting this out. And it was something I just felt like I really wanted to share with the world. And for me, the, the, the whole backstory with our youngest daughter, Sunny, uh, Lauren, my wife, had a home birth. It was fantastic. I got to receive Sunny coming out. It was a fantastic experience. I was very... Um, I was very in awe of the midwives and just the whole experience around it. So I started a foundation called Sunny Start, which was the whole goal was I want to empower people and projects 
behind helping children have a brighter future. And the first project that we're doing is all the proceeds of the book are going to work with um, a foundation called Soul Man, which is going to be feeding children in Indonesia. So one book feeds one child, so all the proceeds are going to a bigger cause. So that's why I was like, you know what? Transform your body, but transform the world at the same time. It's incredible. And it's out now? It's out now. You can go to Amazon. Uh, you can go to cravingthetruth.com, get your copy, and let me know you've got it. Appreciate it. All right, man. Um, anywhere that people can find you? Uh, I am Chris Dufay, Dufay spelled D-U-F-E-Y, ChrisDufay.com or on all the social media platforms, Chris Dufay. And yeah. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you taking the time and chat to anybody. Dude, thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks and we'll see you next time.